Hello and welcome to Carried by the Breeze, a transcending podcast where we discover the divine element within us and learn how to lead legendary lives aligned with our powers and hungry for growth. My name's Carrie and I'm a woman on a mission to invigorate the human spirit and to rekindle long forgotten fires in the hearts of both women and men. I'm a leader, a business owner, a survivor and a natural fixer. I have a vision and I'm on my way to greatness and I'm here to share my journey with the hopes to inspire you to stay devoted to your dreams. Welcome brave hearts. Let's begin. I couldn't simply tell you my entire life story in one sitting, but I am going to try and paint some of it today so you get to know me a little better and maybe it'll help you understand how I tapped into my power and how I decided to give life a real try. So this is going to be a story of how I reconciled with myself and how I'm currently reshaping my life in the image of my vision. This is my journey inwards and the story of how I learned to shed light on the darkest places of my soul. About two and a half years ago, I came to Canada for the very first time. I was married back then and we came here with a plan, excited about our future, with the hopes of, you know, building a life here, building a family. But the last two years have been so transformative and eye-opening in so many ways and it affected a lot. My relationships with people around me, my relationship with myself, naturally, my marriage um, fell apart because I was crumbling down and I was making one mistake after another and I was causing suffering, which I had to forgive myself for with a lot of inner work. So this year, after losing so many things in my life, I had to find a way to see the light again. And deep down, I knew that I was capable of anything I set my mind to. I mean, I read it in so many books. I've dreamt it and I lived it previously in my life. I made so many amazing things happen. And during these past two years, this inner flame I had disappeared and I had to look for it in order to mend my heart back together. So this year, I learned for the first time the importance of taking accountability over your life. I've been through a major transformation. I got to fall in love with the process and with the journey and with just mastering myself this year. And I learned how to actually commit to the commitment and not just have these life changes written down in some God-forgotten agenda, which you use once a year. <laughs> on Christmas, writing your, whatever, New Year's resolutions, right? And I'm here because I'm getting cozy in this. And I'm here for the long run. And I just want to take you along and tell you how it was and how it is so we can all learn and grow together. At the dawn of my life, the world seemed endless. I remember seeing myself the first time in the mirror when I was a child. I remember how mysterious it felt to discover this thing reflected to me from a whole different world. You know, I was a child made in love. Only later my parents' relationship evolved into hell. <laughs> Um, but I was a child made in love, brought in love, and I was a curious child. I remember my parents' friends and my teachers always saying um, how I was exuding intelligence and mystery as a child, you know? My mom used to say that I'm just a typical Pisces, you know? 
but I saw magic all around me. And I was asking questions all the time. The world just fascinated me. The second grade, we were studying the Torah for the very first time. I was reading all these amazing stories of God reaching down to his people to guide them. And he was talking to them. They were making mistakes. And he kept on reappearing and loving them through everything. Well, now I'm smart enough to know he was punishing them as well. But <laughs> that version of the Torah did not include those stories yet. But I was fascinated by this. And I asked my, I asked my teacher, why did he stop talking to us? And <laughs> I remember her looking at me, eyes wide open. And she couldn't... She couldn't find an answer and she just said, well, I don't know. I'm guessing because we fucked up <laughs> wasn't an appropriate answer for a second grade child. Um, but this is just an example of how I was looking at the world back then. Growing up, I was so creative. I mean, I was constantly on the lookout of what, what, what next thing I could be doing with my hands. If it's clay, if it's uh, beads and wire wrapping. I was an artist. I loved painting the world in texture and color. I studied art. I was a poet and a storyteller. I wrote countless of stories, countless of songs, countless of poems. Life was truly magical back then, and my curiosity took me places and just painted my childhood in so much beauty. And looking back, even through the veil of what happened later in my family, it just all seems so, so great. Of course, I started losing some of my inner flame when the abuse began. When people ask me, when exactly did I lose my mother? By saying lose her, I don't mean she's dead. She's just not in my life anymore. But I remember the day when I lost her. I was 13 and we were in the house. My mother, my auntie, her older sister and I. And I heard their conversation. The entire conversation was about how wonderful my cousin, my aunt's, daughter was and how awful I am from being rude to not doing my homework to looking stupid to never brushing my hair to looking wild so many things and I just sat there and listened and my mom was silent and then she started agreeing with so much of what was being said and I wasn't, I wasn't raised under the idea of just respect your elders blindly. Because my dad taught me to never take shit from anyone. Um, he taught me that respect is earned, not given. So I go into the kitchen and I'm like, Bitch, what up? You're sitting in my house under my roof and you're talking shit about me and she goes and she goes and she goes and she yells at me and she basically humiliates me right there in front of my mother saying so many awful things and cursing me and then she just walked out you know <laughs> very dramatically my mom made me call her and apologize and I was smacked around for speaking. And this was the day the trust was broken. And I understood that I'm not at all a priority for my mother. And I realized the relationship wasn't for her what it was for me. I think this was the first time that I felt myself small and not in a good way. And why not in a good way is because when I was smaller, I mean, five, 
six. I used to dream about being very tiny in a huge, huge world. I used to imagine myself in a big field. And then I saw it just, you know, kind of zoom out of the planet. And this was my realization of how <laughs> insignificant I am. But also, it just made me feel from a very young age that there's so much more than what I am and where I'm at, that there's so much beyond. And I did as a child have an understanding of death, not personal, God bless. Um, but, you know, I was, because I was so curious, I was collecting fossils. Um, I was fascinated in a healthy way uh, by dead animals. But my biggest fear wasn't literal death. It was to find myself alone in the big wide afterworld especially without finding my dad it was a real dread of mine i thought how awful it would be to just find myself alone in this big 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 space right i feel like from a very young age i had a connection to the divine i remember having this shadow on my ceiling and the five-year-old me lying in bed translated that into the eye of god watching me while i while i sleep and back then i also used to believe that when we fall asleep our beds just float in space and the biggest tragedy of my life would be to find any of my toys on the floor in the morning because that would only mean that it was swept into oblivion in the darkness of the night under my watch the feelings of guilt for letting my toys down and getting them lost in space was really intense and i just fear that i will be dropped the same way one day same as i was rejected and eventually abandoned by my mother i feared it instead of just accepting the fact that this just happens in life Later in life, when things just got worse with my mother, you know, there was silence and secrecy. It's very, <laughs> I guess it's very Soviet to keep the dirty laundry in the house. You know, it was, um, it was frowned upon to share your problems and your struggles and God forbid what is happening between the four walls of your house. I mean... It's a sacred space for your family and you. And, you know, although God bless all of our neighbors who throughout the years heard so much abuse going on and my mom just chasing us around with knives and stuff. Yeah, I had a fear of loneliness in an already lonely life. You know, I've been born a Beryuk, ancient family name passed down to me by my father which translates into a lone wolf, a wolf without a pack. And the meaning to me was that loneliness was imbued in me and my existence. I changed my last name to Breeze following my dad back in 2009 because I think that the both of us were trying to kind of rewrite our faith because the family was struggling so much and because we were in so much pain, it was a way to, to switch the energies and shift them around and maybe recreate our future. I also remember my mom finding out and completely losing her shit on us. With everything going on, I still had this inner flame burning within me and promising me that I will endure the suffering will end, it's not forever, you know. But I have to admit that I felt cursed for many years and I wanted so badly to break that paradigm and I was praying for it. The reason I felt cursed is uh, quite literal because my mother was a child of an unhappy marriage and... My grandfather, her dad, he committed something that later cost him 14 years in prison. 
and a long life of just dissatisfaction and misery. To put it simply and plainly, he and my grandmother did not love each other. They lost a son together. But the main reason I'm talking about him is because he was born in Azerbaijan. And he was a descendant of sheikhs that came from Iran. And they were a pretty wealthy family. My great-grandfather had multiple sons. He had gold. He had land. Great relationships with his neighbors. But there came a war. And my grandfather ended up selling out the wrong side and having to escape for his life when the other side came to punish everyone involved with the treason. When they came into the village, they couldn't find my grandfather who escaped and was caught crossing the border between Azerbaijan and Georgia. That's when he got to jail. But back at home, his father and his brothers were hanged for his committed crime. And the tale, the tale says that right before dying, my great-grandfather cursed his son for generations to come. And just looking at how things turned out with all of his children and his life, I felt like the curse lived on and was being passed down to me. You know, we all tell ourselves so many stories that eventually harm us and create so many wrong paradigms in our mind. But this was the seed of my pain growing up. I felt like Atlas, carrying the weight of my family on my shoulders. With all my hopes that kept me going, that this is going to end one day, that no suffering lasts forever, I still... I was ready to tell my creator, just let me go. Because I felt so heavy in my soul. You know, I don't remember who first called me Carrie. Because my full name is Carolina. My name has changed so many times during the years. Because it was confusing people. It was too long for children. And I also sometimes felt like I haven't grown into it and I haven't des deserved it yet. I'm only now accepting my name and I understand the power in it and I learned to tap into it. But my name went through many transformations from being Korean to being Karen to being Carrie. But the reason I didn't love Carrie is because again, it carried the meaning of carry a weight and the feeling of being an atlas of carrying the weight and the secrecy and the unspoken PTSD in the family you know we had to just shut up and take it 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 just it was just a lot I remember later in life I was at my first boyfriend's house and we were upstairs in his room and his dad was washing dishes and I remember how the sound triggered me because it was so noisy. Because in my family, when my mother was washing dishes and it was noisy, that meant one thing. Something is about to hit the fan. So I just remember being upstairs and, and getting so triggered and so scared for what is about to happen. And I remember asking him, is, is, is your dad okay? Is he pissed? Did we do something? And my boyfriend had to, you know, um, explain to me that everything was fine. And <laughs> I'm just having a little episode with myself. So what gave me the strength to keep on going? Well, I have to admit that I am kind of nerdy and I really loved going to school. Uh, probably because it was a nice escape from our crazy shenanigans at home. So... I really liked going to school and studying and I was good at it. I mean, elementary was awesome. High school was, ooh, what an interesting time. I am so grateful for high school for the better and the worse. This is, this is a whole entire chapter. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a lot about that. But you know, I was, I was really 
good at things I set my mind to. Despite everything that was going on at home, I still had a lot of curiosity in me. And I also realized that I need to become better in order to escape the fate that was written down by my mother for my life. And I just wanted to be better, be stronger. And I guess that's what's invigorated me so much throughout these very tough times. I got out of my parents' house when I was about 20 years old. I got myself a scholarship and I took myself to film school. I got to live alone with a roommate and I felt like this could be the renaissance of my life. I felt like this is the beginning of my escape and now I'm going to design my life the, the way I wanted, uh, away from everything that was going on at home. And I was just excited to, to put some life in my space. And although I was really excited about going to film school and living on my own, you know, life worked in different ways and <laughs> it wasn't as easy as I imagined. And that vacuum of living alone away from my parents, um, a lot of stuff naturally started coming in. All my demons resurfaced. All of my excitement for film school, you know, I came there very cocky and confident. It just started crumbling down and I had this entire identity loss because I suddenly realized that being a rock star in high school doesn't mean anything. I realized that I'm not the most talented person in the room, that I'll have to really work myself up and prove myself all over again in this new space, a new chapter in my life. And I felt like all my efforts from before to build myself and to become someone, they weren't worth anything out there in the, in the big world. I just felt small and unseen and I felt like my wings were being cut down. Although... I did have amazing professors in film school. I had the Ron Tabari, an amazing professor that taught us how to look fear in the eye and tell it, no, mother f not today. We had Nizar Hassan, who taught us how to dream big, no limitations. Just make it happen and dream big. We had Mickey Cohen, a writer who taught us how to look inward and reflect upon this world with so much emotion. I used to say that Mickey was the heart and soul of our faculty, that Duran was the mind and Nizar was the balls because my gosh, that man was very courageous. And these people believed in me so much and taught me so much about life and really worked hard to invigorate our creative minds and souls and, and put some fire under our asses, you know? But because I was already in my adulthood and suddenly so much freedom was offered to me because I was out of my parents' house for the first time trying to make things happen, although <laughs> I was depressed throughout everything, um, I felt that I could see life without touching it. Just, just dream about it. I thought... I thought that I will never get the chance or the time because I'm stuck and I just need somebody from the outside world to save me, to pull me out of my misery. It was just so easy to expect that after so many years of struggle, you know? So, so back to what I was saying before, I have accepted a role that I never really wanted in life. I was the carrier of worlds and it followed me in so many places in life. I mean, in my career, in my relationships, where I really developed the tendency to put more on my shoulders than I could carry. And I definitely crushed under so many times, although, although I always pride myself with how resilient I am and how much I can take before that happens. I, I noticed this pattern about me back then that while I was crumbling down, I still <laughs> was fortunate enough to impact the people around me 
the comments I got from my environment were that I, I empower people, <laughs> that I spread hope in everybody else. And it was pretty ironic because I myself was lacking that. But nowadays through this journey, I was able to break these paradigms and start listening to the voices around me that really try telling me that I was no Atlas. I was Prometheus, the carrier of fire in life. I was able to put so much excitement in the hearts of the people around me and convince them, not convince them, just show them they're capable of achieving anything. That would made me such a great TV producer, <laughs> to be honest. I was always up to the task to just save the day, make everything work, um, make things happen, you know, no dream is big enough. But just this realization I had this year that I could transform my inner pain into outer flame, it was mind-bending for me. I now feel that the weight has been lifted off my shoulder, that I'm now in tune with my power that was bestowed on me, that so many people noticed in me throughout my life, that I now let shine through me. And the only thing I'm carrying right now is the need to inspire. I carry hope. I strive for excellence. I, I bring the light. I want to illuminate the world. I see the sunshine beyond the suffering. I feel like all possibilities are open to me. And I just, man, I just want to share the feeling. Because I've been through so much. I've been through so much pain and heartbreak. I've been through betrayal. And I live to tell and I just want to show you how I, how I did that and prove to you that no matter where you are in life, how things seem dark and hard, there's nothing truly impossible. You can change anything. Life can change in seconds and I'm just a living proof. <laughs> so when my transformation began, I, I started asking myself, why is it so hard to believe in yourself? I mean, come on, come on. Isn't it basic? Why, why, why does it take so much time to break the walls and the barriers and the patterns and whatever? Like, isn't it just enough to understand that you're fucking up, that the fact that you're miserable <laughs> means that... Mm, something might not be working and maybe you should look into that and do some changes you know <laughs> why isn't it so obvious to us the fact is that we have been programmed and we have been banished out of our divine human element let's say you know the great philosophers the thinkers the spiritual figures like jesus and buddha they all speak of the divine element within us and to make a very long story short, because speaking about the divine element is another chapter that I'm planning on doing down the line. Let's sum it up by saying it's the understanding that you are the master of your own fate. There's a quote I, I love. I think it's from the New Testament by Matthew 1720. And it says, truly, I tell you. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. The reason why I love this so much is because it emphasizes that belief that you are capable of anything you set your mind to. And we've been told otherwise so many times throughout our lives and upbringing and our social programming. We've been robbed from our divine human element. We've been led away from ourselves. And we all believe that if Superman doesn't come to save us, we're all fucked. Nobody understands that Superman lives within. And I used to believe the same. I was just waiting for the outside world to save me, for life to change magically, for somebody else to pull me out of my misery and help me reshape my life. 
so you probably realize how it felt for the first time to live alone and be facing all these things and not being able to fully take accountability for my life because I was so busy struggling with with so much but in recent years I have realized that I am goddamn Superman and I stopped blaming life I stopped being mad with it I stopped wasting my time on asking questions as why I'm the one to get blow after blow after blow and something clicked in my mind that life is just tough man sometimes it even gets ugly and the only thing i can control is not the whole world around me but myself that's when i really started taking accountability and changing my life and eventually what happened is that I went on the hero's uh, journey, you know. Um, the hero's journey is when you have a call to adventure, uh, you're meeting a mentor, you're uh, crossing the threshold uh, between the normal world that you know and the unknown, which scares us so much. And you go through trials and failures, um, you grow new skills, you go through death and rebirth, through revelation and change and, and atonement, and then you get to reap the gifts and return changed from your journey. I realized this year that I had enough of feeling like a vacant house with tons of clutter inside, you know, f spider webs and stuff like that. And I just, I decided that it's enough not feeling at home with myself because my body was aching, my heart was shattered, my dreams were blown apart, and I realized that my biggest fears came true again. Um, immense loneliness, no one around, no way to move home because everything was changing politically as well. Um, but it didn't kill me, and so I really decided to, on my way up, to look at the meaning of the pain. Instead of trying to wash it away and hide it, I decided to, to look it in the eye. Because it was really important for me to learn from this experience. Because I was finally capable, by finding self-accountability and taking responsibility, to realize that I have fucked up so many times. And I could have seen so many things coming... And I still let them happen because I was making the wrong choices from a place from a place of suffering where I didn't love myself and I was basically causing so much self-harm and hurting the people around me that things evolved as they did. So I decided to ask myself, what is this pain trying to teach me? What is it trying to show me? What am I missing about my life? And... Eventually, after a lot of inner work and just being completely and utterly honest with myself. Because, you know, I was left alone in the silence. There was no one to lie to. It was me in the mirror and the gaze we shared. And I learned how to listen and trust and eventually to let go of so many things. I learned how to forgive myself and how to be honest with myself, with the people around me, in my relationships, I started speaking from the bottom of my heart. And when that happened, I, I started feeling the, the inner flame just burst up my chest. I felt like my hunger for life was reinvented. My vision, my dreams, they became so much clearer. And, and we then reached because... Because life was waiting on me to start playing again. To start creating the magic around me. Like I used to as a child. When I believed that everything was possible. And I was reminded of that this year. Through all the work I've done. And all the search. And the amazing mentors that followed and entered my life. The amazing guidance I was bestowed with. I was so inspired that this was 
one of the main reasons it was so important for me to share my story because I know it will find its way to somebody who listens and it will rekindle your soul by seeing somebody else go through so much and still still have that that grain of belief that moves mountains that makes the most biggest dreams come true i've been there i know it's possible i did that for others throughout my career i just never had the courage before to do it for myself and now baby i'm burning I wish I could show you that what happens when you start thinking outside of your limitations is just complete magic because you get the chance to truly live epically. I know it's not easy to go after your dreams, but I mean, what else is there? We have this lifetime and it comes with so many struggles and and demons and bad things happening, sometimes time after time after time. But if you look around, if you truly look around, there's so much proof that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, you still have the chance. You still have the power to reshape everything, to just take your life in your own hands and say, I deserve so much better and this is what I do now. I'm going to go and get that better. Don't choose suffering like I did when I was younger. Because there's plenty of beauty beyond that choice. Nowadays I feel like when I'm gonna stand before my creator, I'm going to thank him for the summers, thank him for the storms, for the hate, the love, the beauty. Thank him for never giving up and tell him that I trusted. And I followed, and I absolutely loved it. I would love to go back and live again. I hope that my story finds you and makes you a little curious about what comes next, because I'm going to take my life so many places, and I already see how magical it's all going to be. Welcome to my reckoning. I welcome you to stay. My name's Carrie. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Carried by the Breeze, a podcast dedicated to invigorating the human spirit through inner exploration and constant daily growth. Hope to see you in the next one. Till then, follow your heart, brave one. Bye-bye.